Today's topic and equations I had a lot of trouble finding during my SE studies. So hopefully they're a benefit to all of you. Let me know in the comments what you think. Let's get into it. That's right, today's all about building deflection. We'll be talking about stiffness, deformation, and what all that kind of means for us as structural engineers. So first off, stiffness is just equal to force over a unit displacement. Now, we all don't like words as structural engineers or just engineers in general. So let's get our variables going. K equals F over delta. From just being able to use math, we can rearrange this equation differently to help us further down the road and say deflection is therefore equal to force over stiffness. So these are the inverse of one another and you'll see where that plays in as we get further along. Let's make sure we're understanding our units here. Force, as we all know, um, typically for structural engineers talking about lateral systems and stuff like that, we'll be working in kips. You can work in pounds. Um, I guess you can work in tons if you wanted to, but kips and pounds, really kips is really kind of, I mean, come on, that's really it. Uh, at least here in the US. Uh, deflection or unit displacement is in uh, some form of measurement. Again, for us here in the US, it's mostly inches. If you have some just absolutely wobbly ass structure, maybe you're gonna be looking at it in feet, um, but typically it's inches. And so therefore, stiffness, we usually look at as kips over inches. So uh, maybe a little little plug for when you're studying for the uh, FE or the PE exam, or if you're out there, you know, grinding the SE exam, when a factor is given to you and you see these units, K over inch, uh, they're giving you the stiffness. So keep that in mind. Talking about stiffness, force, and unit displacement really comes into play for the structural engineer out there when they're designing their building uh, for lateral loading events. So seismic events or heavy wind events. And this is because you can have your building, unspecified lateral system and all that jazz, just your your typical building. The building has some sort of stiffness to it. So whether it's all concrete and it's walls or it's steel and it's brace frames or it's moment frame, all of the material properties and the geometry of your vertical lateral uh, elements contribute to the overall stiffness of the building. Every building has a different stiffness, I wanna say, unless you build the exact same building right next to each other. Um, force is the force that is loading the building laterally. And then when that happens, the building undergoes a unit displacement or it moves under that load some amount, which is delta. Um, what you need to be careful about when jumping into this for the first time is that there are additional uh, variables and code provisions um, through the ASCE 7, at least here in the US, that go into additional criteria and steps that you need to take to make sure your building is code compliant. That's outside of today's video, but that's, that's the gist of how the equations up top translate into things that we check as engineers for building structures. Simply put, there are two things that contribute to this displacement. It's a two-part equation, and the overall displacement, we'll call it, and we'll just keep it as delta, is equal to displacement under flexural deformation. So displacement F plus displacement S, which is um, deflection under shear deformation. Visually, what do those two look like? Well, if we draw a building here and we push on it, flexural deformation, and I'm heavily exaggerating here, you, you know what's going on, is going to do something like that. So flexural deformation, sometimes also called bending deformation, occurs when a material bends under the influence of applied load. While shear deformation, on the other hand, looks a little something like this. So there's not really a bending action, but really um, this occurs when adjacent layers of the material slide past each other parallel to the force. You can kind of think about this, I've been told before, like a stack of you know, printer paper all stacked up. And if you want to push on it from the side, the stack of paper starts to slide along certain planes between the sheets of paper. That's uh, shear deformation. So these two combined gets you your total displacement. Depending on geometries that you have, 
Um, there are different equations that have been cooked up um, for all of the, you know, engineers out there and mathematicians and people who apply this on a daily basis instead of them having to derive it just kind of willy-nilly and spend all this time. Um, other people have done that, very intelligent people, and they have created kind of the following for us to use. So these were the equations I was talking about earlier that took me quite a while to get my hands on. A lot of information to unpack, but stay with me here. I'm gonna scroll down, I know my head's in the way. First one, cantilever columns. This is the most kind of basic one. So you have your little figure here that I've drawn, and then we have displacement delta. Um, this is, again, I know I'm gonna keep it, calling it displacement to keep it um, consistent, but this is also, you can think about it as your uh, deflection of your thing, if that helps you at all. And then right next to it, then we have uh, the stiffness equation for the system. And if you'll notice right off the rip, I think the easiest one to uh, see the comparison is cantilever columns. Remember from above that stiffness is just the inverse of unit displacement. So this equation right here, or all of these equations right here, are just inversed in order to get, make these equations. What you may come across where that looks different, because again, it's difficult to get your hands on these for some reason. So different sources can show different things. And you're like, why is that? They should all be the same. I show F in my equation here, that being the force that is being applied to the system. Sometimes uh, the force is just boiled down to a unit of one and then the equations are given that way. So this F would theoretically go away in the equation. Um, so it would just be H cubed over three EI. Um, but I also like to, just for me, for my studies, I liked to keep the force in the equation. I, I say that and now I'm gonna throw you for a loop here. For my stiffness equations, you will see that I do not have the force listed in the equation. But if I did, to stay consistent, the F would be right there, okay? Um, the reason I did not do that is because stiffness, again, like we talked about above, for units is usually given in kips per inch. And so it's it's saying how many kips does it take to displace um, the system X amount of inches and how you can break that down to kind of find what's called rigidity of a structure sometimes is, well, if I apply one kip to the system, the cantilever column, what resulting displacement do I get? And then thus um, your force is just one, so it goes away, blah, blah, blah. Sorry if that's a little unclear today, but that's, that's what's going on if you look in other sources and you see that um, the equation looks slightly, slightly different than what I have here. But I promise you, this is what I brought into the SE, but always check me, obviously. We talked about that displacement is going to be both um, uh, a combination of flexural deformation and shear deformation. For cantilever columns, uh, shear deformation is not a thing. It's so in insignificantly small, at least from my understanding, that it is just, not even considered um, when doing these hand calculations at that point. That's why there's only one part to this equation. And this, if you might've guessed it, is just purely flexural deformation. So this whole chunk here is the equation that represents uh, displacement due to flexural effects. Fix, fix columns, same variables given in my figure here except the equation for displacement changes very slightly. You get rid of the three and you add a 12 instead. Inverse that, looks the same as above, just there's a 12 instead of a three. All right, same thing, fixed fix columns. There's no shear deformation. I know I kind of drew it like there is shear deformation in my dashed figure, but it's really all flexural driven. Your cantilevered wall, so your shear wall in most cases or all cases, it's gotta be a shear wall if it's a lateral element. Um, you have a couple different variables here. Um, I drew in green A, so A is the looking down the cross-sectional area of your shear wall. You will see for displacement, you have two pieces to your overall equation. Ding, ding, ding. I think things are starting to kind of come together. This is your flexural contribution, and this is your shear contribution. 
which one dominates more over the other one, it will really depend on the, the geometry of that wall and the type of material that that wall is made of. That kind of flips the script of the percentage. Is it 50%, is 50%, it is it 75, 25? Is it 100, zero? Is it 100, I don't, you know, zero the other way? And everything in between. Uh, you take those and you do the inverse and it creates this nice messy equation over here. Now, you may be looking at that equation and going, wait a minute, that's not the inverse. Don't you just kind of like flip the stuff like, or don't you have to do like, you know, if this piece of the equation is up here and the inverse just equals that where, you know, everything's flipped, why didn't I do that right there? It has to do with mathematics and because that plus symbol is right there, I had to look this up because I was scratching my head for forever being like, that's not the inverse though. What the heck's going on? It really is the inverse. That's how it works. It's math. Just telling you that was my process in studying. And it took me a while to be like, are they wrong or am I wrong? What the heck's going on? Next thing that you're screaming at me for right now, I know is G. G, what the heck is G, my man? G is your shear modulus. And that is based on your Young's modulus of elasticity of your material of your wall. That G, at least for our purposes, equals E, Young's modulus, over two over uh, times one plus Poisson's ratio. And this is Poisson's ratio is dependent upon the material that you're working with. Um, here's a couple for all you structural engineers out there. Now you may notice sometimes for masonry that you see it look like this. And that's because they're literally using this 0.25. They're plugging it in. They're getting E over two times one plus 0.25. And when you boil that down, that literally equals this equation here. So that's how they're getting to that. If you happen to see it again, I'm trying to point out the same thing that you may see in other places that looks different. And when you're learning it for the first time, you're like, as soon as something looks different, you're like, ah, uh, ah, uh, how can that be? It can't be different. It's supposed to be the same. So you got to look into that a little bit in order to get your uh, shear deformation, which is this piece right there. I have been told that you always account for flexural deformation, but if through your analysis and through your calculations, you can prove that shear deformation is not going to contribute really at all to the overall displacement of the structure. You, you can kind of, I don't want to say ignore it, but it's going to be very small. So this piece of the equation can kind of just go away when you're doing your preliminary and I'll, you know, and I'll flag it over here too, obviously. When you're doing your preliminary calculations, um, again, always talk with your project managers, your principals, and all that kind of stuff as you go further into the design. But if you were to just kind of ignore this piece of the equation, then that just goes for a cantilevered wall right back, you'll notice, to a cantilevered column system. It's not the same type of system, but if it's just flexural deformation, then that's, that's the equation you use for flexural deformation. So you use it for both systems. And lastly, we have fixed fixed walls, at least for today. I have a few other systems, but let's finish up here. Fixed fixed wall is the same exact thing as a cantilevered wall. Um, and the equations are exactly the same, except you might see similarity here. The three is replaced with a 12, but everything else is the same. And then you inverse this uh, displacement equation to get your stiffness of your system. But hey, glad to be back. Make sure you like and subscribe if you like today's content. You know what to do all to keep that YouTube algorithm running. All right, this is Rich with Team Castava, and I will catch everybody later. See ya.